Happy Friday, everybody. We're live for our now weekly real estate Q&A live stream. We've got Rob Maroto looking, Hello. looking, let me just say it out loud, younger, <laughs> svelte. <laughs> okay. I was hoping for sexier, but okay, I'll take svelte. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that's not my first way direction that I think, but, but okay. Yeah. And Juan Jose coming all the way from the equator and he right. Okay. Looking well groomed as well. It's only me now that is the quarantine look. So our quarantine's just about over. I can tell because everybody's working again. And I mean, everybody means photographers. We don't, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. So i um, glad for that. It's, uh, it seems like it's going pretty well in the industry. The real estate industry looks like it's um, going to be okay. <laughs> so uh, we're just here to, uh, we're going to start out with a little bit of uh, composition uh, tips and talk, and then we will um, be glad to take questions from anybody watching live. And um, you can also uh, join us. I'll put the link in the comments while I let Rob and Juan Jose give yourself a real quick hello and introduction, and I will be right, uh, right here. Hey, so sounds great. Rob. Yeah, so... Uh, my name is Rob Moroto. I'm the uh, uh, founder of Calgary Photos. We're a, Cal we're a Calgary, Alberta, Canada-based uh, real estate photography firm. I've got around uh, s seven people going around the city uh, shooting for uh, realtors, builders, interior designers, and uh, the like. And uh, yeah, we've been at this for 10 years. And we were hoping to have a big party to celebrate our 10 year, but uh, things sort of got uh, sidetracked there. Um, and doing first those you're not doing those distancing like uh high fives with poles <laughs> and stuff like that yeah no we uh we tried that but uh there's something about uh my guys clinking cameras together in midair off a tripod that just not so didn't good. work just no. they can, they can uh, use their remotes <laughs> photography exactly. joke. photography joke <laughs> exactly and then on the personal side, I've got my own website, uh, robmoroto.com. So if you want to check out some of my personal work, go go there, check it out. And uh, I'm excited to see what we can talk about with composition because, let's face it, uh, that's that's half the battle right there. That's yeah, exactly. I would say half is about right. Juan Jose, how's it going? What's your what's your current? We haven't really talked to um, you and I even, so I can't share for you. So get catch us up since we talked to you last. My name is uh, Juan Jose Perez. I'm from Quito, Ecuador, in South America. I'm a professional photographer for almost 20 years. I've been doing advertising photography, real estate, and architectural photography for several years also. And I'm also into 360 virtual tours. And I fly drones. So I. I try to offer different services for different purposes. And uh, I'm glad to talk to you guys and to all the people that is actually hearing us right now. Well, later. Can I can I just, just transition? This is a perfect transition. Jump right in because it's a Q&A show. I have a question about composition and drones because I have been done very little of it, drone okay. photography. And the, what I've done has been course 360s and that has a whole different composition discussion but yeah. um, I was thinking that drone photography has an advantage because you can position yourself for the good light and that as we know that's a problem with interior photography is that we're working usually in not not the best situation we if we can't usually in real estate be there at the right time that we'll, what we want. So I was thinking that you can really compose along with using the sunlight in the best way. Do, do you think that's true? Is that like an advantage to... Um, in several ways, yes. One of the things that I like to think with drones is that it's not actually a drone that has a camera. So actually it's a camera that can fly. So actually you can put the camera that can fly in every point that you like. Yeah. But one of the things that you you should avoid when you're using drones is that the people tend to show too much sky. So 50% of the, of the framing is the sky. So that's, that's why it's better to low your, you know, your, your camera and to show exactly what you need and not necessarily go too, too high up because not just because it's a drone, you have to fly very high. You can just be a couple of meters above the, the ground and you can have a very interesting perspective 
Of course, you can also use a, a pole to do, you know, that's, a, that's what I do. That's what I do. Photography without, you know, without uh, verticals distorted. Yeah. But yeah, it has a lot of uh, uses, and uh, you have to get used to how to use them, how to use it. Yeah, so no blowing high. the sky too much, no going too high, be close, and as you mentioned, find the best part of the property and take advantage of the sun position to get the best possible image with the drone because you can move wherever you like. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more freedom. Cool. Yeah, um, we're already getting the Canadians um, chiming in here. This seems to be usually real estate in Canada photography live i don't know i'm trying to make up a canada <laughs> joke but actually it does feel karen, like that, karen it? is in the us of a there we go oh oh, oh 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 nice oh, Czech, Czech Republic. love Czech. Oh, i've been oh, there it's once a beautiful, it's a beautiful it. country i've been there once thanks for come joining us and making this in uh, well canada we don't usually us uh, especially as west coast americans i don't think we consider canada or mexico to be really international it's just very normal but um so canada i joke around but it's the same really <laughs> so anyway peter thanks for making it a really international or multi-continent show um uh, who else is joining us so far um oh joel uh well well yeah <laughs> always <laughs> how often do you use bracketing in your interior shots well, All the time. we'll, we will talk about the, yeah, we're, um, <laughs> we're pretty much bracketing oriented to us three and we're on the Photomatics channel, mm -hmm. which I should probably introduce a little better, shouldn't I? Um, uh, we do it all the time. Definitely. Even, and that's whether combining it with a, with a flash or not. Um, I, 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 I do mostly no flash and almost all just bracketed. Um, that's right. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Bracketed natural light. Um, oh, and, 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 and thanks for coming too, Joel. Um, oh, and we have people chum, coming in now. Good. We're getting some people are watching live from South Sher Carolina, Sherry, yeah. South Carolina. All right. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba. Hey. We're, yeah, sorry. Hey, Ron, I was thinking yeah. in our last couple of episodes, we were talking about uh, dynamic range and I was meant, I kept on mentioning this one image that we took that, you know what, we can actually make an HDR from one image and i want to i actually got it i found it so uh wondering would you guys mind if i just uh, shared that right now let, let me uh, do one thing real fast sure uh, I'd rather let you guys talk more um uh if you are new to this if you're watching and you're like well i don't i don't have the stuff to do what you're talking about bracketing um go to that go to hdrsoft.com there's the link in the video there but you can go to the home page click on that kind of there's that COVID-19, what we're doing link there. And uh, HDR soft has been great. They're giving away a license for the Photomatics Essentials version app. So it's kind of, it's the one for people that are new to HDR. So that's perfect. And I realize that is not the most real estate people, but I don't know who's watching live. You know, if, if you want to try this out, there are, you can get a license and I'll, so you don't have any watermarks. And there's also a lot of information to help you get started because we're not going to cover everything here. So uh, do that. I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to see that things are loosening up in a lot of places. Uh, so I don't know how long that whole offer will continue. And check out our new Photomedics HDR Facebook group. Join up. <laughs> All right. So um, that's, a, I think, a good intro. Um, Rob, take it away. I'll put your screen up as soon as you... Oh, yeah, hold on a second. All right. So take it away. Here we go. Perfect. So take a, take a look at this shot here. Okay, so this is one shot out of a Fuji uh, GFX 50R, and that's their medium format. Now, this yeah, tell, shot... Yeah, sorry, tell us more about that camera. That's the medium format. It's a is medium that the one format. That's, that's, that's been around a couple of years now? Uh, let's see now. The so me, 50 the, the S was. It's uh, the 50R. This is the rangefinder version. I think that one came out uh, last year sometime. And... We bought it because we wanted to get it for portraits and for, you know, just doing something different. And so this is one shot that I took out of a furniture uh, company. And, you know, this was a dark, dark place. And so when we 
take a look at the shot, you know, of course, the windows are going to be exposed because it's a nice, bright, sunny day outside. And then inside, it's dark. Like, there's no, the lights are hardly working inside. And uh, the uh, the windows didn't really fill the place. So what it felt like was more like this inside. But check this out. So now we take the, the dynamic range of this, and we can go all the way in and see all the detail even underneath the sofa there like it's incredible but not only that that's at that's at almost three stops up now let's take it away the uh, way down to around four stops under wow and, mm -hmm. and take a look at that you know you can actually see everything outside yeah, it's really clarity. yeah it's we also had this discussion before about uh do you do a window pull and show what's outside and my response was it depends like really do you want to see that outside or do you want to yeah. just keep it nice and white and sometimes, so we left it sometimes around sometimes the view is a huge feature and sometimes it's one something you want to hide exactly and so for this one we completely hit it but what we did with this image that was interesting was we actually took this so that we took one image that was around here because we wanted to get this detail here on the furniture and then we also wanted to still keep this kind of feel so we took the two, three images maybe, converted them into TIFF, and then we put it into Photomatix to come up with our, our final image where essentially it looked like this, but the back of the chair was uh, a little bit better um, uh, controlled, let's say. That's a, now, what, what would you say is the dynamic range of that scene? I have no well, idea. They're <laughs> saying uh, they're saying around 14 stops. Yeah, and, 14 uh, stops. I think the same, yeah, around 14 stops. Yeah. But it's, so it's fantastic. So like I can do. What is, what is what is the model of the camera? The brand? Okay, that's uh, a, a Fuji that's a, film. It's a, a Fuji. Film. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to point out that um, when you mentioned that there was this camera could do this this uh, amazing feat, and I said if that's true, I'm out there buying it. But I didn't really understand which camera you were talking about. You're talking about a medium format rangefinder, yeah. big big britches camera which is um i just looked fifty five hundred dollars for the body and um yeah. and i mean a, no medium format's a different thing you know i i'm a big proponent of um i love my micro four thirds olympus setup but you know yeah. what it has a huge it has a micro four thirds means a smaller I'm not talking to you guys it's just in general for everybody you know so uh, a dslr has a standard sensor size and when you get make a smaller sensor size there's a lot of advantages to that like the smaller equipment and um mm -hmm. more nimble and everything. there's a lot of there are disadvantages too and dynamic range is one of them now a medium format is the opposite right you have this enormous sensor that can do a lot more so if i've been predicting that you know one day cameras will take care of all this dynamic range of course it's going to eventually get there and the first one's I'd, I would love to get my hands on one to try it out. And if that's happening, it's happening in the medium format range right now. And but that, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal to uh, to get into. And I don't think we're thinking most real estate photographers are doing that, at least not yet. I no, put that like in the arch architectural category, right? Yeah, like I bring this out whenever I have a, like this shot here with a person in blurred in the background. I can't do that with bracketing. Yeah. And so I need something that can, do I something could. more <laughs> so um, um yeah so it's the fuji film gfx 50r and the r stands for the rangefinder now that came out around a year ago uh after that they came out with the gfx 100 uh 100 and that's a 100 megapixel uh medium format with image stabilization which i've played with it it's around a ten thousand dollar camera it's beautiful i love it what do, you, what, do you think, what do you think, Juan Jose? How much? Uh, how how big could we get a gigapan shot with, uh, well, with have, about about five five shots you know, around? <laughs> for for real estate or for architectural photography, I haven't used yet a medium format camera. I have used it in advertising photography. Yeah. For you know, for people and uh, for stuff That's like you know what? One one time I remember I did, as you mentioned, uh, five five or seven. Uh, pictures for stitch them together using a Hasselblad camera, a medium format camera. Yeah. So the final file was a huge one. Uh, it was very interesting to, to work doing a, a stitching process with a Hasselblad. And then the, the, <laughs> the other a, thing, with a thing. also, of course. 
another thing you do with stitching is to uh, to basically uh, emulate a medium format look by stitching together regular camera shots, and <laughs> that that can be done too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. That's a. And since we're talking about comp- composition, by the way, um, I love the. I think there's a trend a little bit with having uh, that kind of motion person in the scene. I don't know if that's uh, really if it's still there. Uh, because I haven't been involved with that kind of photography for a little while, but it's a, uh, I, I like this. I like the, what it, I like what it lends to the, to the scene. I like it a lot. And, um, it and you know, really one, well. one of the things, I don't know if you, Rob, Rob uh, you can tell me this. A lot of people, a lot of times ask you, well, what's the shutter speed for getting such a blurry effect? And the answer is it depends on the lighting conditions. So there's not one straight answer. Well, okay, no, I'll, I'll disagree with that. Uh, really? So, yes, so the so the shutter speed for getting a person walking is not dependent on the amount of light. It is dependent on how far away they are. That's one of because, the aspects, yes, but also it depends on how fast the person walks. Yes, yes, but if, if you take everything else the same, like, so the person is walking the same speed, if they're closer to you, then you're going to need to speed up your uh shutter speed because now for, like if you think about this being your frame your frame here and they're walking from here to here in one fifth of a second versus you know that's you know in this it's it's one foot so that's really quick but you know behind me if somebody is walking one foot it's not that much motion i remember you mentioned that with the other with the other show that you show us the um... Your picture oh. that are more, most yes. traveled off, and you said that the same person, and you, 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 you got different effects depending on how close to the camera the person was. That's right. That's right. So I had to change it from one tenth of a second uh, to one fifth of a second, depending on how if they were closer or farther away, and that's all also because of uh, how far away they were if they were across the street. Or one lens and what lens you're using also it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a aspect to, to take oh it. for uh, for this one here I was using let's see now it is the 32 to 64 and uh, I did that at uh, geez okay so Ron if you uh, and, for, and for middle and for middle format cameras that you know the, the focal length is, is different for if you compare with a 35 millimeter camera, so it's not, it's not exactly the same. It's a yeah. conversion factor. No, it's very much bigger. And uh, so I, I don't know if, it, if anyone out there has, no, uh, has tried this and seen this. And it, it happens for people who transition from uh, APS-C and they go up to their first full frame. They'll notice that all of a sudden, the F4 lens that they have, all of a sudden, F4 has a lot more bokeh in the back than from uh, in the in the full frame than it did in the crop sensor, and that's just uh, a function of you know uh, how physics. Um, yeah physics <laughs> essentially. So you can have like you know let's face it, this phone here has a what was it a f one point two lens, but but the sensor is, is tiny. Close. Exactly, and so even even if it's a one point two, it still can't do a real bokeh. And so <laughs> uh, when you go into the other way and you get a shot like this from a medium format, well, all of a sudden everything changes. So now shooting in say an F8 on a medium format is almost like shooting at a 3.5 on a, three, on a 35 mil. So this shot here, if, if for anyone who can zoom in there, it's shot at F29, just so that I've got everything in focus. Yeah, it's a, it's a different, you, I think you lose more or less one stop. I mean, if you if you shoot like f11 using a medium format camera, it's like yeah. shooting an f8 mm-hmm. with a 35 DSLR camera. Yeah, yeah, Karen, that was what we were uh, talking about. He he grabbed this from one single shot, and there's quite a lot of dynamic range in there. Did you have the finished one again? With Actually, I don't know where I put the finished one. Of this. <laughs> I just pulled it off from my uh, from my back up there. And sorry, but, I, I mentioned I grabbed the I looked for the Fuji. I pulled up the 
S accidentally, I guess. Anyway, the 50R that you have, that's the $3,500 body, right? Yes, it's a cheaper one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I went with a cheaper one because, well, it's... Is it, does it, it share the same expensive. sensor? Or? It does. So it's the same sensor. So why not, right? So like, a, little more, a lot more. It's a bit more manual to use, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's just uh, like I mentioned, the, the, what's the right word? The, the big kid kind of camera, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, it, ta it, it, it levels up what you really have to know about photography. You know, re in real estate, mm -hmm. I think we have not only very expert photographers that do real estate, but you also have people that just start a business and they're not, and there's nothing wrong with this. They're not necessarily photographers to start with, but they become that. <laughs> and yeah. so the, we get, I know I get a lot of questions about, um, can you just tell me the settings I need to use? And, and I'm always one of those, it depends guys. Like not only, <laughs> not only your equipment, like we've been mentioning, not only does it matter, not only does your sensor matter, but how it, how the relationship with the lens and what, I mean, there, there's a million. And talking, talking, talking about the lenses, Rob and, and Ron, do you use tilt and shift lenses for do all the what? time real estate photography? Tilt and shift lenses? No. I've, 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 rented, really I've rented it or rented them a couple of times and I, I stopped finding the, the benefit. I mean, it was, um, they are super sharp. They're super expensive too. <laughs> yeah. And, and now, now is one, one of the things that, that technology has helped, has helped us with is, um, that you can just, as long as you zoom out and include extra area that you're going to crop, yeah. you can easily you correct that now. So megapixels that with right. the resolution that you have nowadays with cameras, it's yeah. not, it's not a big deal. I mean, yeah, I don't, I, and at the at the risk of uh, people asking less questions, <laughs> there, I won't. But one of the things that is interesting, one, one of the things that is interesting to see with tilt and shift lenses is not just that you can actually you know correct the verticals and everything, but the perspective changes. I've seen some comparisons between the same focal length, using or not using a, a tilt and shift lens, and the perspective. So the countertops, for example, close to camera. Mm -hmm. Kind of changes. It's not exactly the same. The the, the perspective is is yeah, more the, recent. The tiniest bit of the tiniest bit of and shift. The tiniest bit of shift. No, the tiniest bit of tilt will shift extremely. The perspective, right? <laughs> it's like a good way to put it. And the, and the, the actually tilt shift lenses. And I'd love to know if you guys agree. They're limited because well, they're they're primes. So there's mm -hmm. that's one thing, but. Um, they're not that wide for me and my need for really wide lenses. So uh, when I've rented them, I felt like I felt more limited, but that might just be my experience in using, or maybe I was trying to use it when I, and not, not for the right purposes, mm -hmm. I'm sure. But I'm, I'm no longer a big fan, not, nothing wrong with tilt shift lenses. Now they're more for creativeness, I think, than yeah. correction. What, what is the focal length when you're shooting an interior property that you tend to use more? The most. I mean, it depends what is the final result you want, but what is like your workhorse lens that you use all the time? 1424. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've got, so with the tilt shifts, I've, like, I have the 24, I have the 17, and I've been, um, you know, the 17 was too wide for a lot of things. Uh, and it, it was, it was either too wide or wasn't wide enough. So for example, with a 17 tilt, I loved it because uh, I wanted to use it for say shooting exterior condo buildings, like, you know, the one back here. Uh, I wouldn't actually be able to get the full height of it uh, at 17 mil. I actually need to go a little bit wider. So I could take the tilt shift and you know, shoot it once here, shift it up and get, and get the second shot, merge them in a panorama. And that would work. But what I found was that yeah, I was always struggling because 17 wasn't wide enough for what I needed it, needed it for, for some of these exterior things. And then when you went inside, it was too wide. And so what I was doing was I would shift it, compose it, and then I would take it back yeah. back home, get into Lightroom, and I would crop it again to around a 21. I, I, I do the same. I do the same only when I'm shooting tiny spaces like, I don't know, like a bathroom, for example, like the, and the owner or, or the real estate agent wants a bathroom to, to be covered, I use uh, sometimes a 14 mil. Yeah. And it's funny because really, like, 
uh, the 24, the 24 is not wide enough for some of these things. And so you're stuck in this bit where you're like 17, 24. I wish it was a 21. And then I would actually start, I, I might use it. But now that we've got, you know, 50 megapixel, like I'm, I'm using a Canon 50, uh, sorry, a Canon 5 DSR. That's a 50 megapixel camera. Yeah. I can just shoot it wide and crop it in and yep. it's great. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Um, we've got um, one specific one about i'm not sure if who's the, who can talk about the fuji more right. but uh Shari, okay Shari. so Shari, yes uh let's i say, have let's used say, my... let's, let's uh let's read it so anybody that i was watching some facebook lives recently yeah and it's hard to keep up with the text sometimes if you're on the phone and on oh, your phone so she enough. says i have a canon 6d that i use for real estate and i've been wanting to try my fuji xt2 have you used it and with what lens i'm finding my 18 to 55 isn't quite there so which one is the xt2 the xt2 is the aps-c version of it so okay, the 15 so to the 18 to 55 would be roughly around a 24 70 mm -hmm. equivalent so it's, not, it's not wide enough so she, she probably mean do you um, sure you, you probably mean uh, that it's not quite wide enough yeah exactly it's not quite yeah. Yeah. Or exactly. If, so, if, it's a, if it's a quality thing then i i think there's always then there's workflow things that can overcome anything but uh but if it's not wide enough, yeah, then um, mm -hmm. that's the difference. Now, the 6D. Uh, the APC sensor, probably a 12 mil would be a good well, option. Mm -hmm. so, the, so just to jump in here, the, the Fuji actually has a 10 to 22 that, of it's course, true. 10 to 22 on a crop sensor. Yeah, kind of have the same lens. The same yeah. and it's, it's a perfect lens. So if you have that lens, it's a... Up in Canada is a thousand dollar lens. Uh, in the states, it's probably what seven hundred dollars, but 45. it is, yeah, forty five dollars. Ah, jeez, Canadian pesos here. Um, <laughs> the no, uh, yeah, uh, but using the ten to twenty two, it worked and it was nice. And the color simulations are great. The one thing I can say about the Fuji uh, Fuji stuff is that when you go into a place and you start shooting with the ten to twenty ten to 10 to, 20, 10 to 22 yeah you don't have to color correct it's amazing you know how like we were i think we talked about this last week or the week before how the iphone does uh white balance differently where it's like yeah yeah, yeah. you mentioned that yeah almost doing zone type and highlight type white balance well the fuji feels like that too where i could go into a place with mixed lights and shoot it but you don't get those harsh oranges and blues it's just, it looks natural. And especially with some of their, like, uh, uh, if you put on like a, uh, use their uh, classic Chrome kind of uh, film simulation, it looks fantastic. And for some of the, the cheaper places, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind doing, and doing it. I've taken uh, uh, pictures with my X-T2 when I've gone on vacation and, did, and you know, you stay at a nice hotel, you take a few pictures. And I swear those pictures are good enough that I could actually sell them back to the hotel. Um, isn't, isn't that um, isn't that a great reason to say when someone says what's a, what camera should I go with? Would wouldn't I would like to try this because if that's true, I would say go Fuji <laughs> because oh, Fuji color, color with interiors is one of the more difficult tasks I would I think mm -hmm. for in your in getting that great result. We we deal with it in different ways, but if Fuji is is um ha is handling that almost automatically then that's a huge thing for fuji that i, I should, haven't know, tried I should fuji. know about thanks guys <laughs> i haven't tried fuji yet i haven't in years I, I used to shoot i used to shoot fuji film when mm -hmm. that was a thing fuji film yes yeah. and like yeah, no, no digital camera yeah, before before digital i was kind of, i was a mostly a fuji film um shooter and um uh, I, I was able to uh, get a, a borrow of a, uh, it was one of the early Fuji SLR, DSLRs, and it had a different way of handling things <laughs> that had a very clear feel to it. And I, I would, yeah. so um, um, seriously, Rob, is why wouldn't you use Fuji if that's the case with the color? What's oh, the... no, obviously, I would say uh, yes to it. The only reason that we don't, from a company standpoint, uh, is like I said, I got seven guys out there. We've been doing this with the uh, the Canon infrastructure for ten years. So all of a sudden, to take I 
know, seven guys and take the, let's see now, the X-T4 just came out and the lenses, the, the different lenses, the different uh, flash modules now, it would take me, oh God, it would, it would bankrupt me to <laughs> change everyone over. And, right. but that's about it. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'd love, the, I'd love to be able to use the, the color of the Fuji. And here's the thing that I love about Fuji. Okay, I shoot Canon professionally, and that's all I take to my jobs. But when I go on vacation, when uh, I'm taking the kids to the park, whenever I'm going to a, a friend's uh, kid's birthday, to uh, any kind of social event, I will take my Fuji. If somebody asks me to shoot their wedding, I will take a Fuji. Anything else, I will take a Fuji. Cool. It's just hmm. because of, it, you know, I mean, I'm in the Canon infrastructure for my commercial stuff that I have to use my Canon. And on the Fuji, are you using, are they, can you use the, um, do they have a full frame and a crop sensor lineup of, of, lineup of lenses that you No. Can? Okay. So this is the strange thing about Fuji. They do APS-C and they do medium format. Oh, they're, you, you know, it's funny because when I said that, I was like, I haven't really heard of full frame. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I haven't heard of full they frame. They don't do full Fuji. frame. Huh. And I find, you know what? It's fine. I like the uh, the the simplicity of the XT4 is great, um, and so we want uh, we always take. Uh, I know we we're, we're supposed to be doing a uh, this thing on composition, but I almost want to show you. Um, show us a Fuji shot that we can uh, we can dissect your composition, and you guys can argue over how many, <laughs> wall, how many walls in there in there and. It, it, was it good enough? <laughs> yeah, right. No, uh, I won't. Uh, I won't subject myself to that. <laughs> but uh, here is, yeah, sure. Why not? I, I will share my screen for this. Um, we uh, we do area shots, and the reason that we do area shots is because um, how many times have you had it where a realtor sa uh, says, "Hey." I love uh, this this uh, this building. This home is in this great neighborhood. It has this, this, and this, and uh, we want to showcase the area. Like, take a picture of this mm -hmm. the school over there for me. Many, or many, like place, that, right? many places you're thinking about buying that the, the most many of the features are the area. Right, yeah. and so we get that all the time. And so what we do is we go around and we shoot. Now, if you've ever gone around and tried to shoot the exterior of a school while school children are w walking out the front door and you're, uh, you've are you got a camera sticking out of this, the driver's side of Not your car cool. and you're shooting, you will have the cops on your ass right away. Yep. And so with a Fuji, it's such a small camera, people don't care. You, you look around and you take a couple of shots and then you go around and it's like, oh, no, I'm actually following that bird that's flying over there. <laughs> and it's can done. You, can you get a big, can you get a hat or a vest that says real estate photographer, something like yeah. that? Just the, I'm just shooting. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, honestly, I just, I walk around like I'm a tourist and it works. Like this shot here, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, default settings. I was I was gonna I was gonna put this on just to be this be a joke. You can you can wear this. Nice, nice. I used I used but, to wear it to poker, but it's a. <laughs> you just you get something about I'm a professional. I belong here. A press pass or something <laughs> like that. Right, and so I don't know. And I I shot this. I, it's all handheld, and you know there's kids running running around playing with their dogs during. Uh, during isolation, but okay, so this is what it looks like straight out of camera, but that is what it looks like after you nice. pull the highlights, bump the shadows. Oh, it's 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 yeah. one pick. It looks yeah. HDR. One one of the things that I have I have seen I haven't used used uh, Fuji cameras, but I have read some articles about it. One of the things that people say about Fuji is that they manage the greens and the blues in a very precise way mm -hmm. and, uh, i don't know but you also mentioned some oranges and and uh, yellowish colors so at the end of the day they're managing the colors very well in, in general 
their colors are fantastic and um I, I love it i i have nothing but great things to say about it so when the fuji xt4 came it was announced you know i called up uh my guys at the at the camera store at the camera store.com or ca and told them hey i want one and next thing i know i've got one in my hands and it's great um so yeah it's it's fantastic Com composition wise on this one you're just walking mm -hmm. around snapping photos but i mean you have you're a photographer so i've got my my eye keeps moving through there you've got a you do have a strong leading line i would say because you've got the whatever what is that crazy sculpture on the, that on the, is it's, on, it's right on the third you know the, on yeah, the rule of third spot calgary yeah. street art right it's right mm -hmm. you know it's up and down it's on the line of third the left and right it's on it's on the halfway point i feel and like you have i feel like there's a line it's, it's not a it's a it's a um, um my words are failing me now but it's an implied line from the right corner right through there i i, I think it feels good so. yeah well I, I if like you do the have you have you seen the uh uh what's the other grid that I wish I knew how to do this on Lightroom where it shows there's one way of doing the comp it shows the composition grid where it almost looks like this uh circle uh, yeah, the, shell yeah, 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 the, the golden ratio you can you can um use the O button the O key oh is that what it and is you, you can use the O there's O yeah. and there's, there's O and there's shift O and you put yeah. it in different places you can mm -hmm. yeah you, you cycle through the, okay, are you in Lightroom right there hit click O or hit O okay are you on the crop tool right now Hit R and then O. Uh, so R is the shortcut for the crop tool, everybody. Okay. <laughs> when I, once uh, I figured that, okay, there you go. Now hit O. There you go. Keep hitting uh, it, and it's giving you several there. tools to look at the. Now hit. Now press different, Shift O. Uh, Shift O. Okay. There we go. So if any whoever's watching on a really really small screen right now, there's a, there's this um, assistant on Lightroom that shows some a light line. And it'll show you rule of thirds. It'll show you, I believe that's like golden ratio. Is that still the right mm -hmm. one? Um, uh, and some other different um, composition uh, tool technique helpers, I guess you'd say. And yeah. you can, if you can get your subjects onto some of those lines, a lot of times it'll really strengthen the image. You know, it could be interesting if the cameras has, if some cameras has this this option integrated in the in the in the state. Most, most of them have at least. Yeah. Most of them have at least the tic-tac-toe rule of thirds. Yeah, that, that's for sure. But these, this one here, the golden yeah. ratio with the with the spiral. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, can I can I just turn this into a quarantine and composition tip? Is this is a great thing to do if you're maybe it's too late in quarantine because a lot of us were going through our old work and seeing what we could do and re, and one of those things is to recrop. You know. Um, uh, what was the composition? Cr yes. I was calling it for a while. It didn't, it's crump, an composition. Composition. It's an ugly word, so it didn't take off. But <laughs> you can you can rethink old images, and this is a great. I, I, I recommend to try it out, but you might go down a little bit of a rabbit hole because you you can pull up old images, maybe those kind that you thought were going to be great, but didn't turn out to be like real winners, mm -hmm. and take a fresh look. And going through, if you didn't know about it, going through those composition is, is it a tool i'm not sure the right word for it but hitting that o and shift o while you're hold on while you're in crop so open up the crop tool and then hit o multiple times and shift o and you'll find all these different options and it might might pull out some gems that you didn't know were there oh, exactly um questions uh we have um wait wait there was one earlier first what would be the term to use to do research on how to crop two photos together? I assume that means two, like T W O. Oh, so to add them into one. Okay, so how about this? Let me see if I actually have that. So, well, uh, Soraya, hi. Um, what kind of cropping them together? Does that mean stitching them, or does that mean like bracketing, I overlapping, think or that's does that mean... exactly what she's asking? Is how do you stitch them together? Stitching. So, yeah, that means. See if I can find it. Uh, huh? So, Raya, okay. do you have do you have Adobe already? The uh, pro, the pro yeah, stitching. Yeah, Lightroom has this panorama function that you can actually stitch. Yeah, if you're just putting yeah, two, if, if you're just putting two together, like if you've rotated the camera just to capture more um, field of view, you can do it right there in Lightroom or Photoshop. The professional yeah. tool to take it farther is PT GUI. 
PT. Or a free, uh, free one, Hugging. Hugging, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so how about this? Let me just uh, show you. It's uh, H-U-G-I-N, right? Wait, Hugging. Forgot, I haven't seen that for some time. G, yeah. I-N, I think. Hugging. Okay, so. All right. Uh, let's see now. Application window. Your entire let's do the entire screen. Okay, so I'm gonna just dangerous. Share. I know, I know. Oh, it's dangerous, but here we go. Uh, just give me a quick sec. I'm gonna head on over to uh, Lightroom there. Okay, so I've got Lightroom going uh, going here. I actually got. Uh, let's see now. Let's increase the size of these. So you can see I got this image here. And that's our final, and I got that image. So to take those to make the final image, just take those two, select them, right click, and in here where it goes edit in, you will see at down here, it says merge to panorama in Photoshop. Once you do that, it'll come up and it will ask you how you would like to do it. I usually like to just go at it as a auto And then you just let it stitch. And it thinks, and it thinks, and then it. One of the reasons to get specialty apps for things like stitching which Juan Jose and I use a lot, and for, for uh, HDR, which we all use a lot, is the speed. <laughs> they usually yes. do things much more quickly. That's why, like so many things, uh, for um, Soraya and whoever just wants to do one once in a while, by all means, uh, you probably don't need anything else, but uh, yeah, if you want to really is... take it farther, then getting a specialty one's better. Yeah, PT GUI would be a whole lot better at this, but again, we're able to do this straight into the native uh in Lightroom, get into Photoshop, back into Lightroom, and then bang, there your image is now imported in and you can just start working on it right from there. Wherever it ended up. There it is. Okay. Oops. So that's about it. Yeah. I dropped off for a second. I didn't know if anything happened there. Um, all right. Uh, I was trying to find the link for Hugging, but it seems like all I can find is really a, like a SourceForge download page. So I'm not sure what to recommend, but H-U-G-I-N is a yeah. uh, open a source. Or, or there's, least, a, there's a learning curve to, to use it. Uh, yeah. Probably more difficult than PT GUI. That is a free option. Yeah, PT GUI is like 300 bucks, right? <laughs> it's a, yeah. Um, it's a fantastic program. We've, we've used it for uh, for our 360s when you know before all the Matterport and iGuide stuff came out. Mm -hmm. and we're actually stitching things by hand. And the nice thing about PT GUI is uh, we got it down to the point where we had a what were we using? We were using a Canon 70D with a Sigma 10 to 20. 10 to 20. We set it at 10. Set the uh, aperture at. I think we set the aperture at f13, put it into hyperfocal distance, turned off the the autofocus, and then we duct taped everything so that it couldn't the lens couldn't move. We then put it onto. Uh, do you use a nodal ninja? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I put it onto nodal ninja, put everything there, taped everything onto the nodal ninja. So that's one camera <laughs> that does nothing but 360s, and once we did that, we take a 360 find a perfect stitch, and then we could make a template out of that. And then every time we went out and took the same thing and it didn't matter if it was a big place, small place, whatever, we would take that uh, that camera out, do a 360, and instead of having PT GUI stitch it, we said, apply this template, and it was a perfect stitch every time. Yes, working so, with templates, it's, it's amazing. It's so exciting. This lens does nothing but 360s. It's even been, it's even been um, 
Is kinda, that four and a half? Kind of circumcised, actually. What is well, uh, that? That's a Nikon ten point five, right? Yeah. And so you oh, I would shave it. And then and then there's uh now we're photographers. We don't use duct tape, Rob. No duct tape. Use, <laughs> use, use gaffer tape. <laughs> and this lens, this focus ring, never needs to move as long yeah. as the camera just stays in manual mode because hyperfocal set. And so if I just have that lens on there, that's all it does. And the same thing you're talking about for kind of a specialty situation. I use, I use this one here. I use the Canon uh, 8. Okay, 8. Yeah, I have that. Yeah, I have Neo. that one too. So this, this lens is amazing too because if you want to do some 360s with uh, using a 15 mil, yeah. you, will, you will get a, a lot higher final high res my, my, my backup, my or, backups, backup or setup is a... Yeah, or if you're using a full frame, you can only use uh, the... Um, you can choose to use the, the 12 mil, and with just four around, you get the complete sphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, there were comments that I was bringing up. Um, so, Vivid EFX, I use a... Yeah, yeah I'm looking for that right now. That's it's, the same one I was looking at. Yeah, here we go. Ah, uh, so it says, go ahead, go ahead. it says, I use a Canon ESR with a Tamron 17-35 f2.8 core, but does not seem to be able to, but seem not to be able to get anything less than 20 mils without significant distortion. Yes. Um, same question, Vid EFX. Are you, use, are you an Adobe guy or something else? Because um, yeah. those uh, software have pretty much automatic fixes for that. Mm -hmm. If your camera doesn't have an automatic fix, um, Rob, if you still have Lightroom open, or I can open it up, but um, Do you? The, uh, there are, there's a uh, lens correction section, and if it isn't automatically corrected by turning it on, then there is a manual correction in there. Yeah, that, that and right now, oh, I should say, if you are uh, on, on a Fuji system, you may need to use a, um, the manual uh, to fix some of your stuff there. Um, it's they not don't, quite. Have, yeah, those 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 lens corrections usually are based on profiles that are yeah. either created by the camera maker or could be by the software maker as well. Uh, it's it's interesting that they don't have for Fuji because, for example, talking about drones, they do have a lot of profiles for correcting the distortion using different kind of drones and different lenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in fact, the, using using drones and the smaller the sensor, the more, okay, since we're talking about wide angle shooting typically here, the uh, smaller the sensor, the more need you're usually gonna have for lens correction because no lens is perfect. They all have distortion, even the fancy ones. So you'll just uh, need to trust the profiles or use the manual uh, version, the manual fix. Oh, Rob's got Lightroom up. And here's the other take that, that we have. It's like, so for example, the, the thing that, um, hmm, oh, strange. I don't see my uh, menus there. I just see my gallery. Okay, well, that's fine. I want to show you this image here. This is uh, shot at 12 mil. 12 mil, yeah. Yeah, now remember how we were talking before and you guys were asking me, what, uh, what lenses do we recommend? And I said, I use it. We have a standard 12 to 24 mil for all of our real estate stuff. And it is because of these powder rooms. Now, yes, you do see the distortion on the sink there. Like, there, let's face it, there's, there's distortion there. Like, that sink is not that wide. And uh, you do see the distortion on the doors. I kept this door frame in here. And part of that is because if, uh, sorry, no. Uh, let's see now, if we are doing cropping, one of the things that's going to happen is in MLS, MLS is uh, done on a 4 by 3 whereas photos are taken at a, what was it, a uh, 8 by, sorry, photos are taken on an 8 by 12 whereas MLS takes it as, as an 8 by 10 And because of that, when it crops, it'll go down to something more like that. And now you notice how all of a sudden now part of the door with the latch is gone. And we've also cut off the part of the door on the right. 
And now we're still left with still being able to see the entire toilet and we get to see the floor and we get to see the ceiling. Um, the biggest complaint that I hear from realtors is that uh, the bathroom pictures, you can't see what kind of flooring it is in it. And sometimes, let's face it, if it, there's carpet in the, the bathroom, you don't want to see it anyway. But aside from that, in most cases, you do want to see what the type of flooring is in there. And so this is why we shoot with a 12 mil. Yeah, and, and one tip that I can give for when you're shooting 12 mil for spaces like this one, the bathroom, is that you can actually, as you mentioned, you can crop it, but also you can use in Lyron this tool called Aspect. I think it's Aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can shrink the distortion and you can, you, can, uh, you can get a final image with less distortion at the edges. Have you, yeah. have, you, have you used that one? No, we. You know what? We're trying. Uh, we try and keep everything as uh, simplified and in, in two lightroom as much as possible. So, let me get uh, get another image here for you. Um, lightroom will do a little bit of that, Juan Jose, for based on the profiles. You'll you'll get a little bit of that. So it'll try to real make realistic the those stretching edges. Yeah. Okay. So at, let me at least my at least the the profiles that I. I've noticed. Um, yeah, yeah, but I'm not saying mind. only the profile, but I, I, I'm mentioning this because there's this tool that when you have a wide angle lens and you crop it and you have some distortion, you can actually kind of fix that using this aspect slider. Yeah. And it's mm. very helpful, actually. So we're, we're talking about it, the kind of distortion that just comes from the, the physics of the wide angle lens, right? Where it feels a little more where stretched at the sides. Close. Yeah, so, so this is different. This is different than where we started with that uh, Boeing barrel. Barrel or pin cushion distortion. Oh, my hands are not high enough. Barrel and pin cushion. <laughs> I, mean, I used to do that. I used to do that all the time talking about this like 10 years ago. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so to answer the question, how do you handle distortion? This distortion, let's take a look at the shot here. Okay, you see where the desk is? The thing that, uh, people, uh, that uh, I find people do is that they'll shoot this shot and then they'll shoot another shot uh, right in that back corner and try and get the desk in. And as soon as you do that, that desk is going to be way too close to your lens and you're going to see the distortion from that, right? And so what we do is instead of doing that, like we can get back here. Um, still, this feels a little bit too close, but I am as far back as I can. We do this where we go past it and then we, show, we open it up and show the room. So this what is about, shot at 18 uh, mil. How about, desk, how about above it? Uh, no, no. What we do is uh, okay. So here's the thing. Um, I'm going to go through this entire set uh, to just prove a point. Remember, that's, I, right, that's right, Garrett. Shaved, shaved that thing down. Manually. Remember when we were doing the show the other day and we said uh, 70 shots at a twilight. Well, here's yeah. one that we did, and this was 134. And in how much time? Uh, an hour and a half. Now, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear a bunch lasts of a long time there. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> but here, here's the thing that um, that I want you to see is that you'll notice that all these photos feel like they're all shot the same and they all blend in together. And that is purposeful because what we're doing is we're shooting at all the same height, roughly the same focal length, and we don't have to change much else after that. Yeah, I would call that also professional. It's it's a marathon, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, yeah, um, the, it's it's a lot of work. But you know what? We we get there and we get there around half an hour before sunset. We've got time, and we'll go around. We'll shoot the exterior. And this place, unfortunately, it, it didn't look this this nice out with the blue skies or every, anything. If anything, um, we got there, and geez, I should show you what it looked like when we first got there. But they're, but they're not replaced skies? Oh yeah, no, we, we figured out a, a very lovely way to just be able to easily re replace the sky there. Um, yeah, I mean, we, were, we did a couple articles on distortion. Um, are you guys familiar with SLR Lounge? It's SLR a, Lounge. SLR Lounge is a really good, um, a lot of educational uh, information for, for really Really impressive photographers that run it. That's um, Pi Jersa and um, Chris 
Chris Lim. I don't know. I'm trying to give credit, <laughs> but um, we were doing some articles with them, and um, we did one distortion. And it was really interesting to think about when you try to put that stuff on paper. There are a lot of different kinds of distortion that people talk about. They, they say, "How do I handle this distortion?" And there's <laughs> so many kinds of it that come from different places and have different ways of adjusting for them. So, if you're if you be careful to go down the the, the distortion rabbit hole, but actually. Um, Google SLR Lounge uh, distortion, and you probably find that article. Um, uh, da, da, da. Garrett's in the house. How's it going, Garrett? All right, we have Germany here. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. <laughs> eight to I mean, is there eight. an eight to fifteen? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. It's uh, fisheye. Is that it's, fish lens, yeah. It yeah. is a fisheye. Yeah, it's it, a really sharp one. I I I, I used to have it. And I used to use it for 360 panoramas. Yeah, hmm. that, well, that was popular. But using that with a full frame, you have to take six. One around, one up, one down. Yeah, that's so, a similar to the 10.5 before shaving it. Yeah. You <laughs> um, lens correction in my old Photoshop. Is that like the Photoshop um, printing place that closed down here in town? <laughs> There's a place down where I live. It was called Photoshop. Then I think it was oh, there really? since. I think it was there since before the software. I think it looked really old. Um, uh -huh. let's see. So oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh huh. Who wants to take this one? Uh, also, for windows being so clear, like the picture up right in the office. And you're talking about Rob's uh, Twilight photos. I think. Do you have to set up for HDR photo merge, or are there? terms for videos I can research for editing in Lightroom um, he cheats a little by shooting when it's <laughs> when it's a little darker outside <laughs> mm -hmm. no um, yeah. when it's when it's a bright window yes by all means um, oh I have something for that um, I'll, I'll pop up a link Sarai in a second when I when I dig it up um, yeah that, that that house was a little uh little strange because uh all the interior lights were white balanced leds and so that's the only one, reason why you you'd find some of the, the shots where it's twilight yes the sky is blue but you look up and the grass is green and the only time that that actually happens is if your interior lights are um uh daytime balanced leds yeah so you went through and replaced all the non uh, light, the non daytime LEDs. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh, we we just got there and it just happened to be that way. So yeah. It's, uh, um, talking about uh, composition, I think it's interesting if you talk about one perspective, one point perspective composition, two points perspective composition, three points perspective composition, and also the difference when you take pictures horizontally or when you take it vertically, depending mm -hmm. on what is your final client. Because have you noticed that if you're publishing all your pictures in, in Instagram, actually they look better if you t if you take them in a vertical way because they, they look uh, bigger. So yeah. when, when, you're, when you're taking pictures for a real estate agent, normally you, you take all the pictures in a horizontal way, right? But when you're taking pictures for a designer, for example, I think it's a good idea to have both uh, options. So at the end of the day, the, the editor that actually graphics all the, the final magazine, let's say, they can play with what kind of final picture they can use. Oh, uh, definitely. And, and also, it, the people, I don't know, but all the time we are like, saying wide angle lenses and stuff but lately i've been doing some exercises just to practice how can i capture a property using like let's say a 50 mil lens mm -hmm. or more, like more close-ups that's more up you know into designing uh, requests you know for a designer but it's it's interesting to see also let me share let me share one um let me share. I don't know if you can. Well, actually, I'm right now in Chrome, so I think I can share. Yeah, share. Share the tab. Jim's using uh, Micro Four Thirds, right? The Lumix with the seven fourteen. 
voltage. Yeah, I have, a, I have a 714 for the... Someone's sharing it. It does a good job, but it, it does take the lens profile to fix the, the distortion we talked about. Someone's sharing it? Uh, Not yet. Okay, so let me, let me open this report. So, for example, when I go to a, to a place to take some pictures, uh, as we mentioned before in the other show, the, the past show, we, it, it, it's very nice when you do um, a one perspective, one point perspective shot like this one here, this one here. Yeah, we, uh, it's, it's not up there. Did you share? Uh, let me, let me kick yeah, you. Let me I have kick shared. You. It's not, it's not, I'm not sure. Okay, let, let me try again. There, uh, there you go, there you go. Okay, sorry. Okay, and now you're on. So, yeah, so when I go to a property, I tend to, if, if I'm working for a real estate agent, I tend to do these kind of shots, like one point perspective, but also like this one here. Meaning, or, meaning one point perspective means? Means like this one, when you have the wall, the, the, oh, like the most distant wall right in front of you, parallel to the sensor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like just straight on. It's just, exactly. So the, the, the problem with this kind of uh, composition is that you have to be very precise composing, right? Of course, after after you took the picture, if you didn't do well uh, in camera, you can fix it in, in post uh, using Lyrum with different so tools. We're, so we're uh, since we're on composition in a, in a general theme, uh, what are the things to look for in the one? Okay, so one point perspective. Uh, I mean, a lot of people aren't going to know really what that means straight away. So you're usually that's opposed as opposed to having a corner in the shot, right? That's, so, that's exactly right. So when you're, when you're shooting straight on, then different things apply. Like probably you're, usually it's going to have to be quite symmetrical, I would say to be. Yeah. Pleasing. And one of the benefits of doing so is that this, this composition is really good for designers because they yes. really want to understand how's the, the form of things, how are the, um, how are, everything is so, so symmetrical that actually looks more like kind of, I don't know if that's the word, elegant in a yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in different, in different contexts, it's a good idea to do a two point perspective like this one. Because real estate agents, they don't necessarily want to see the design. What they want to see is the space. There, they evaluate more the space uh, than the than the design of the place itself. So it depends what what kind of final client you have, right? Because uh, because having that kind of uh, having those lines that that are they, they show depth in the space, yeah. So where, exactly. where the one point doesn't necessarily depend on how you compose it otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and one was it. Have you run into this where you get into a place, designers ask you to shoot it, and they said, "Oh, I really want this one point perspective of this," and you shoot it, and you look, and they've got their lights hung just a little off center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's 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 a very good observation because I have noticed and I I, I have learned myself. But when you take one point perspective photo, not just you have to uh, try to compose in a in a very precise way, and then you can fix tiny details in in in, in Lyrum, for example. But there's this this bottom in in, in Lyrum called full when you when you you know that you can actually fix the verticals manually. Uh, yeah, that, that's, the trans, that's the transform tool, right? Yeah, but there's one called full that is not for verticals, it's not for horizontals. It's, it's more for like a complete fix of the image when you take one point perspective image. And that one is very useful because I have tried that one. And actually it helps a lot for placing all the lines very in a very symmetrical way. Would, would you say oh, yeah. you want that one? Would you say one point perspective is more um, risky or more takes more thought and more more precision? Would you would you say that's true then compared to? I'm sorry. Not. <laughs> to, to me, to me, it, I think it takes more to make a strong image 
when it's a one point perspective? Well, definitely. Like, so yeah. one, if you scroll up to that office image there uh, on the uh, the one right below that, There's that orange one. one, that one's brilliant. I love the fact that everything is symmetrical, even to the point where you got the outlet, yeah, right the outlet yeah. dead center. <laughs> This one here. That's phenomenal. Yeah, believe it or not, I pay a, a lot of attention to this one. I move a tiny bit uh, uh, both uh, chairs to, to get that. I feel I feel like I feel right like that's this I feel like the the outlet is the subject. <laughs> yeah, like we uh, we as for, uh, as real estate photographers get so anal about the details like we'll you know had one of those chairs moved. Had if if the the like those are those are chairs that spin. So if the legs weren't exactly perfect and they were just a little bit off that image wouldn't look good exactly. but you've got it perfect there and uh that's tough and so to ron to your point you're right doing a straight on is so much more difficult but um what i you know what i find is that and maybe this is just um you know some of the places that i've shot we go in and we see like the chandelier and the table and the chandelier is not perfectly over the table and it's just off center just a little right. bit and so you take that one point perspective and then you get to the point where you have to go and start moving furniture more just to make it look perfect because you know, it's there's, not there's one picture here with a chandelier and believe it or not after i took this picture i realized that the third flame was matching the first flame here yeah so I, I didn't like that. <laughs> I preferred to put that flame right in the middle, but I didn't notice at that time. Right. Yeah, that's tough when you notice those things afterward, isn't it? And yeah, uh, I was gonna say I have I have a I have a tip for doing such a that especially like a one point perspective when we're talking about making them symmetrical and perfect perfect is um, use a uh, some kind of off camera viewer. So like instead of not even mm. not even not looking through the viewfinder that's really is it can be tough even the the small screen on the back of the camera depending on some of them have big fabulous screens yeah. but i would really recommend using either like a companion app that lets you shoot remotely so you can really see the composition or a cam ranger if you're if you're into that yes. one of those kinds of things that lets you view the photo like on an ipad for instance or a bigger yes. phone i think it's really uh, I mean, the the ones the I don't consider myself to be the, the, any kind of top photographer in this area of that, that kind of photo, but the, the ones those really professional architectural ones and the serious um, and serious real estate photographers are really doing that. Um, they're doing it a lot anyway for convenience and things, but I feel like in that kind of photo, that's more important. And you know, one one of the other things that the people uh, or new photographers that ask me all the time is what is the right height for taking yeah, pictures in, uh, for interiors mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know what you think about this guys because there are so many different answers but I I like to place the camera right in the middle it not necessarily always goes that way but I like to place the camera right in the middle between the, the floor and the and the and the ceiling and high enough to see the counter, just yeah. a little bit, right? So, if, if of course, if the if the house has very tall uh, ceilings, you, you will not be able to, to to place it like that. But um, at least at the end, I mean, because not necessarily when you want to see a place, you have to see it from the eyes perspective. You can actually see a very nice place when you're sitting, when you're in a in a lower position. So it depends what is the final mood that you want to transmit. And also taking taking in account things like the top counters and mm -hmm. you know things like that you can actually give more information to the potential buyer, right? Yeah. I think is for you guys for you guys, is it still for me, it's still a process when I go to when I'm in a place and this is just my again, I'm it's not my main kind of all everyday photography like a lot of a lot of you guys so I, I still have a little bit of a process and i start with that rule of thumb with about a middle between the ceiling and the floor or around i could say like belly height for me anyway i'm a little bit taller on the taller end but uh that's where i, I start with and then unless there's a reason to 
change. And the composition scene, a lot of times it shows it's itself once you start looking through a viewfinder or or that, <laughs> that other app. So uh, you start with that, but then don't feel like uh, you, you have to follow those rules because they're, they're there to be broken. And the, um, people will adjust that for things like not wanting to show the under area of cabinets or wanting to show what's on top of, a, of something. Uh, if there's too much, well, um, ceiling heights are different. <laughs> so there, well, there, there, so there's a lot of, so yeah, go ahead, Rob. So, you know, I, I hear, I hear that a lot where it's like, okay, try and get halfway between the, the, the ceiling and the floor and then, and then adjust from there. Um, we, uh, we like to look at it differently because so for example, our perspective on things doesn't change regardless of how high a ceiling is. Um, like it, it's it's nice like when you go into like a, a cathedral and you're you're 15 feet up in the air and you and you do that one great shot of the interior that 15 feet is nice but when we're talking about real estate uh the things that matter are like kitchens so even if i had a kitchen in a place with a 20-foot ceiling if i shot a kitchen from a 10-foot height i'm i'm, I'm yeah. looking down on it because yeah. the countertop doesn't change the height of the cabinets usually don't change. The, the the range doesn't change. And most chairs are standardized heights. Bar stools are standardized heights. And so are, so is your dining room table, living room, and all that. So what we do is we base it on just a general. And we say we always shoot from around uh, sternum height, or we call it shoot from the heart. You know, uh, it's, it's a marketing thing that we say. Um, and we find that that height works for 90% of all the properties that we shoot. And the only times that we really increase it from there is just like you were saying, when you're in the kitchen and you have an unfinished underside of an upper cabinet and you see the white on the black cabinet, that doesn't look good. So we just lift it up just slightly so that we're flush with it so we don't see that white or to hide the under cabinet lighting um, and things like that. But aside and, from that, and I say the, other, the, other, the other thing to me that sets, because um, I, I agree with you, is that the reason there is no steadfast rule is because things are different and the uh, ceiling height changes. So that doesn't, you, you can't always go by that. And also like for me, belly height is probably apparently your smaller photographer people's uh, sternum height. So mm -hmm. it's hard, it's hard to really show where, where to start. I tell people like when I'm talking about, I talk to real estate agents and brokers and I say, and they're on their, like on their iPhones or their, their, their mobile phones. And I tell yeah. them, um, good, like we said, we would say in um, sports, take a knee. So you're, you're down on one knee and then that generally puts you, puts a good photo at about the, your eye height at that point. And, um, uh, and the, but the, I want to say the other thing that, that will tell you the right height <clears throat> is when you're doing that, that show that you're setting it up to show the room, your verticals will tell you about the right height. Because if you have your lens, if you have your camera level, which is so important as I think everybody knows is you can't have your vertical lines going diagonally. Um, once you get it leveled, a lot of times you're going to be able to just set the right height just by looking at through the, through the screen of the viewfinder. It's just going to talk to you. It's going to speak to you and show you. So if you worried about the verticals, if you make the verticals, one of the first parts of that process I was mentioning, it's, it's mm -hmm. going to just, it's going to reveal itself. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, when you're when you're doing 360 pictures of a place, I uh, I, I have no, I have noticed that it's better to, to place the camera a little lower than the same situation taking a still picture. And even more if there's there's some people in the picture, the people look a little better if the camera is a little bit below the 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 how to say the, the, the level. Their eye level, right? Yeah, no, I agree. Interesting. I would, mm, I usually aim for about the standard eye level, about, about five and a half feet or so. I, I usually have my have the camera sitting around here with, <laughs> to me, and well, on the for three sixties. That's interesting because, you know, you're one of the hot shot three sixty photographers out there. So I'm going to try your way and see if I can't adjust that. Yeah, you, maybe, you maybe, maybe I've been doing the same thing for too long. <laughs> And sometimes it's just a couple of centimeters or inches, and, and that's mm -hmm. it. It makes a big difference. And, and yeah, we'll save that again for 360s. 
That's another one of those yeah. where it's a little bit of a process. Of, you, it seems like normally it seems like it's so clear that you shoot a 360 right from kind of dead center. And then about 10% of the time, it's a horrible shot and you really need to think about where to adjust it. But that has a different kind of composition rules. I used to think it was so simple. I used to no, think lately that. I've been doing some 360s by placing the camera right next to the floor, like in a very, very low mm -hmm. position. And it's amazing the, the, the results that you can actually get. I mean, if you're, for example, if your client is a, is a company that hires you for, for doing 360s and they sell flooring, right. you will accentuate the, 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 the product that you're selling, placing the camera down because they are going to be more prominent, more in a more, you know, in a more important position because you're close to the floor. And that's the hardest part. That, that's the hardest part to shoot. Huh? I, I would love to do work for flooring companies because the hardest I did, part. I did once, like uh, several years ago, and I did some uh, pictures right in, in close to the floor, and I was feeling kind of weird because usually you you never take three sixties or stills so close to the door, to the floor, but the result they were pleased. With, uh, with their soul because they were selling flooring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I spend, I spend too much time putting, getting the floor right because there's a typically a tripod in the way. So we, we spend a little time dealing with the floor and I feel like I spend too much time on it for the benefit because nobody really cares about the floor typically. <laughs> and then, and then uh, that's not true if it's flooring. So it'd be really worthwhile. Of course, yeah. the, the new, the new, uh, the instant three can sixties, like my Theta, the well my fate is a little bit older and there's a tiniest bit of something that needs to be corrected um where the tiny tripod <laughs> holds the tiny camera um, mm -hmm. but i think the newer ones even um they just fix the tripod area by themselves it's absolutely amazing that's another reason to go with those so let me let me ask something let me ask you something rob and bob when you go to a property and you go to the master room or yeah. to the kitchen do you see like a couple of angles that can work or you actually try to capture so, as many pictures as you can, like four, five, seven, or are you just focusing two? Okay, so it, it depends on who the client is and what the purpose is for. So if I'm shooting for a builder, uh, I know that they're wanting the one shot that is going to sell that property or sell a whole bunch of homes, something that is going to be on the first page of their website. And so for that one, uh, I go in and I'll look at all the angles and say which one is going to be that killer shot. And I will compose a place uh, based on that. Like there's there's places where they're so tight that uh, you really can't get a good shot. Like uh, here, Ron, if you want to just pull up my uh, uh, feed there. Um, mm. All right. So uh, let's see now. I'm sure I had a shot here. Hey Jim, Anyone Jim has a Jim has a good question. So we'll answer that in a, in a minute after. And uh, I just want to kind of put a last call for questions out. We should uh, cut it off uh, yeah. in another little bit. So if anybody has any questions, okay. um, please let us know, and we'll try to hit them. And Jim, just uh, in a moment. Yeah. So let's see now. I could have sworn I just saw the the photo here. We put we, I put a lot on here so that we can actually talk about them. And because of that, I can't find it. Oh, this one here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you'll notice with this one here, we've got the chairs on. The lower left there now that's those chairs are probably around three inches or less from the counter uh, countertop that means if you if you think about it if you sit on those your knees are actually touching the underside of the yeah. that lip there it's uncomfortable there's actually a box uh an old tv box underneath those to prop those up oh, oh okay thanks i was gonna say this is all staging right this is all for, for, the, for, the, for the photograph yep mm -hmm. yes because i had to do that to make the shot work yep. because without that you can imagine if those chairs were you know you, you can see the distance uh you can see that from the chair to the lip is about the same amount of space as from the chair to the bottom of the frame mm -hmm. So we even that uh, even that out for composition, and but the only, the only way to get that was to raise up the chairs. Really good point. And, really good point. And just just to just to ask you for my just a few inches higher or lower would make a 
huge difference in this composition, wouldn't it? It would. It would. And so I, I put the composition of the camera right at the same height as the uh, underside of the cabinet. Because what I found was that at this height, I could see over the plants and I, it hid, it, it hid the, uh, there was a little strip of LED lights underneath and it hid that. And I could see right, I could see the, um, uh, the gas range. So everything just fell into place there. And so after that, you know, you move the, the plant, then you start moving the glasses, then you start moving the decanter, then you start moving all the stuff behind the, uh, yeah, what, the what made me, uh, what made me notice the height most after you mentioned the stools and I thought that height made a huge difference, but the one in the back, it looks like there's like a, maybe a soap containers or something on the counter in the back mm -hmm. where I thought, wow, that's it's separate from the other things. Barely. I probably would have removed that. <laughs> There's, but I'm, no, not sure, there's a, I'm not sure if I would have or not, but there's a, it, there's a certain part where when we get into show homes, you can and you can't because yeah. they've paid a stager or a, an interior designer to design this place. And because of that, the designers uh, sort of take ownership of the design. And so when we start taking stuff away, they get real, they start getting really angry at us. I, I should, I should clarify the way you did it works. I'm saying I think that my solution probably would have been that I wouldn't didn't think it was going to work, and I probably would have said I really want to take that out for the for the shot. Um, mm -hmm. What you did really works. I just was maybe it's a confidence thing, but I, I just felt like uh, yeah. Uh, but I see what you're saying. But then at the same time, and not only not just in this situation, but in any, they're also paying. You know, not, let's not talk about this particular photo, but they're paying us to get the photo so um it also like the designer has their what they want but if ultimately i'm here to get you a good photo then maybe don't be afraid to do it or maybe do it both maybe do it both ways if you have time yeah we've done it a couple of times where we did it both ways where um we do it for the designer we do it for the uh we do it for the designer and then we do it for the, the builder yeah so yeah yeah good really great shot great shot um yeah. this is one that i have thought of a lot over my years um, working in a city with uh, small spaces small condos mostly my my real estate photography time was mostly in small spaces and so Jim's asking is there a point where a very wide angle shot of an interior is unethical in your mind because the room is not that big and he's referring to the fact that uh, the wide the wider the lens the wide lens makes things look farther away details farther away details in this lens are far are closer than they appear and mm -hmm. um and i had clients that said that that's why that's one reason they'd hire me is that i can capture the whole room so i was using like the 10.5 and stuff back in the day when that yeah. was harder and uh so i wonder that because in real estate you have to show it real you can't you can't fake things mm -hmm. and in um I don't know what do you guys think is it uh, is it unethical to i think the same it's it's an interesting question because I remember that I, several years ago I did a, a photo shoot for a property and I used a 12 mil lens in a full frame camera because yep. the owner wanted to make all the spaces look bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day when the photos were published and the people went to physically to that, to that place to know how was the, the, house, the, the house, they were disappointed because they were expecting a, 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 a much better, much bigger place because of the pictures. So that's why I I try to never go under, let's say, 16 mil. Yeah. Trying to keep, even 16 is a, it's a, a little bit wider in my taste. I mean, for... Uh, but uh, if, you, if you use a very focal, a very wide focal length, everything's gonna look different and it, it, the people go to the place and they were gonna see like what, what's happening here the, the place is i thought it was too much bigger than it is that's that's the thing with, uh, the with real estate though there you're trying to show this you're trying to show the space and almost every realtor almost everyone involved wants the shot of the whole room of each room the whole room typically and a lot of times that's the only way to do it now you'll have hope maybe you'll have other photos that complement that one and show uh, I suppose I suppose in the end you're 
they're seeing the square footage of the place as well, I suppose, if they're looking at it, right? So it's not like it's a secret. Um, but sometimes I compare it to like um, privacy issues in photography. Like when, like what, what can you take legally speaking, at least in the U.S. anyway, uh, if you're out in a, in a place that I can be in, in a pub, as a person, as a public person, I can take photos, whatever. You can't walk up to me in the U.S. You can't come up and say, you can't take my picture. Yes, I can. I'm not saying I would necessarily. I'd be nice and not do it, but you can't do it. Now, the, if you're using quote unquote technology, then you might be breaking that. So the, the example would be somebody's house, you're walking down the street, you have, a, you have a regular camera, you can take photos of the house. If the, you happen to see the person inside the windows, then that's how it is. Sorry, but that's not a privacy law. I'm not saying it's cool. I'm just saying it's the law. But if I have a zoom lens, that's all different because the zoom lens is considered technology. So what I'm asking, and I know it took too long to get there, but is a really wide angle lens also technology that changes the fact that says mm. we're doing something that's using technology in order to show something in a way that we normally wouldn't? That's my question without an answer because it, you're doing what you're asked to do, which is capture the whole space. And there's only one way to do it, and that's how optics work now. So I don't. That's I know it took a long way to get there, but what do you guys think? Is that is that like a a technology that's making something different than reality or doing something that I couldn't do without. You're, you're changing the, you're changing the reality. So in, in yeah. a way you're faking in space. So uh, if it is a little bit bigger and it looks a little bit bigger in a photo, it's okay. But if you're actually changing a lot, you're lying to the potential customer because you're saying this place is huge and, it, and it's not. Right. So in my perspective, it's Just, like, does, and gives, you, you, does the intention does the intention have anything to do with it? Like your your guy said, I want you to show it, making it look bigger than it is. That sounds mm -hmm. more wrong to me than just to say, well, I'm capturing the whole room. It's the only way that's I can why, do it. You're right. That's why when when this customer asked me to look to, cool. to capture the, the his place in a with a wide angle lens, showing that it is yeah. a lot bigger than it is. And I did it that time, and then I realized and said, "Okay, I'm not gonna do it again. I'm gonna explain to the customer that I'm gonna use a wide angle lens, but not that wide, so I can preserve the sense of the space in a very realistic way. Yeah. So when the people come to see your place and they want to rent it or, or sell it uh, or buy it, I mean, um, they will not be disappointed because they had a, a totally different uh, imaging in their." Jim, 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 what do you think? Have you been have you been asked about this? Because uh, it's actually it doesn't keep me up at night, but it's something I've been thinking. I've thought about over the time, and um, I'd love to hear, like if maybe people have asked you or if you have an opinion, yeah, let us know. Um, no, it's, then, a, uh, it's a funny one. We've got um, actually one of my my photographers on uh, on our team. Uh, he's he's got his uh, major in uh, in ethics. <laughs> he's got a. And so we've got a philosophy major on our team, and we've we've asked Fun him and that. And, yeah, right. Uh, but his response was really neat. He said, "With anything that you do, it don't you can't think of the the action and tie it to the ethics. You have to think about the intent, and that's what you can tie to ethics. Right. So, for example, shooting a gun at a living thing." can be considered unethical or ethical depending on whether you're shooting somebody or an animal for for feeding or or are you shooting an animal as a pest all these things like the ethics comes from what the goal is or what the the meaning is not from the action itself um so what we've done in, in our in our business is we looked at it and we said okay well what is the intent behind us shooting uh, shooting photography and our intent is to help the photo uh, help the client sell their home, and because you know, like one you're saying that uh, the if you shoot a place too wide and a person comes in and they're disappointed because it's not that big, well, that's our fault. We didn't take a good picture, and so we look at it that way and we say um, we did our job wrong because we created something where they client thought it was too big and so take it away from the ethics portion take it away and then let's look at it as the uh did we meet the intent 
of the photo uh, intent of the job, which is get me some great photos that we can sell with. So my, what I'm realizing now, this is a great conversation, by the way. Uh, what I'm realizing now is that uh, those wide, those super wide angles are often necessary to do that part of the job, which is to show an entire room at one time. So mm-hmm. it's not the only room, only shot you're taking, right? Or you're not taking only those shots. You're taking, a, you're taking, you're, if you think of the whole package that you deliver to show the potential person, then your overall body of work for that job is to do the job of selling the house, not just the one image. So if you're, so I think that, that that's where I'm going to land on it for the moment anyway, is, is that you're, it's not the only shot you take. So you'll, you'll do other things to also to use that as well as other photos and maybe videos and maybe the floor plan and whatever to show what the space is. How about that? I agree. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good answer. Jim, Jim says, uh, I've not been asked, but I take interiors of mobile homes. They always look bigger when I'm done, but my boss has no complaints. That's probably the case, Jim, is they, <laughs> they're going to like it. So what I, and, um, again, thanks guys. Cause I like, uh, this is think about, uh, how your other, how your really wide angle shots and other ones as well, how that describes the entire home. Um, James, do your clients need any special software to view 360 shots? Another really good question. Um, (laughs) (laughs) No, they don't. You might, (laughs) if you're taking them. (laughs) Uh, There are, let me throw it to you guys. There are a few, there are quite a few options. Can I throw it to you guys? Um, Let's not, let's, there's, Real quick, there's Matterport that has its own viewer. It's all built in, takes care of it. Um, you create it on site. It's uploaded. It's built. They don't need anything except a browser. Um, what about regular 360 shots? You guys want to take those a little bit or want me to? Uh, you know what? I am I am not a 360 guy, but I did get a question today that was interesting. They said, um, we took a panorama out of Matterport and they asked, how do I put this onto Facebook and do a Facebook 360? And they couldn't get it on there. So that's okay. one of the other questions. Facebook okay. takes, um, Facebook will just take a... It's like you're it's triangular, but, but not from not from Matterport. Not from Matterport? I mean, if you take it as a scanner, no. If you take it as a photo, yeah. Can you, from Matterport, can you get a equirectangular shot? Like it just means a yep. flat shot? The, the system, yeah. I mean, what, what I have heard, I, I, I'm not exactly uh, sure about this, but what I have heard is that you cannot actually take pictures or uh, scans from Matterport to take it yourself. They are just saved in the cloud. But if you do a kind of hack, which is not good, but I have heard that, you can actually take the take your tangles from it. Oh no, Matterport will let you uh, download the full uh, equi- 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 rectangular. In Spanish, yeah. equi- rectangular. In English, yeah. I have no idea how to it's pronounce the same. it. It's the same, uh, yeah. equi- rectangular. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, so you can't get it. The Matterport g- gives you that option. I, I, I don't use very often Matterport. I'm trying, I'm, I'm using right now more Cupid's with a 361 foot camera. And you're trying to it's a very good option too. That's the thing is if you have if you're shooting Matterport with your Theta, then you can get the images off the oh, Theta, right? Yeah, but oh, if, so. you're, if you're using your scanner, mm-hmm. if you're using the Matterport scanner, you cannot you cannot get the the scanner. No, you can. Well, yeah. Let's let's uh, let's yeah. suffice let's suffice to say if you if you okay. have, if you I have it. I knew I, I I lately I knew that you can actually get that. But if you make a hack, but if, if but you're saying that the company uh, gives you the, that option to yeah. download the X from a scan, yeah, they will Ooh. let you. No, I didn't know. You take the, uh, the 360. It's it's new. Let's put it this way: Matterport has been changing their their back end a lot lately, and uh, I think let's, let's face it, they've been they've been growing for a while now. So I think they've had a little bit more money to invest into uh, uh, to all these features that photographers and people have been wanting and that was probably one of the big ones so yeah hey, uh, um you can uh okay if you have a if you have the panel the panorama and it's a flat image it's called echo rectangular it's exactly two wide by one tall ratio mm-hmm. um if you have that 
you can upload it to Facebook and it usually will recognize it as a 360. If it doesn't, there are some EXIF data changes you yeah. can make. It gets, little, made of that. it gets a little mm -hmm. nerdy, but um, if you're having trouble with that, email, you can even just, you know what, um, email me or shoot me a, fa <laughs> shoot me a couple, Facebook there are, message. There are, there are a couple of ways to. Of, yeah, to yeah you, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit of a hack too, but um, let's, let's move, um, move on. And for anybody that wants to know more, I can help with that. Um, uh, uh, there are settings to change in Facebook. Exactly. It is, um, it is possible. Yes. And, um, you can take guys, Rob and Ron, sorry for saying this, but I have to, I have to leave. I have really some, something urgent to, to do right now. Yeah, no worries. We're going to, we're going to cut it off. We're going to cut it off too. In a second, I just want to take care of any last questions and we will uh, say goodbye. Um, uh, Looks like there's some Matterport people in the chat there. So I don't think we have any yeah. new questions. So we are going as we always do. We keep talking and talking and going long. So let's go ahead and um, take that cue of uh, taking off here. Um, just if you have to run right away, one was I go ahead. Um, but uh, well, orbitalvision.com. Nice to talk to you guys. Uh -huh. I, uh, the other day you asked me about my Instagram. It's Juan Jose Perez Fotografia in Spanish. What, what is it? Juan Jose Perez Fotografia. Juan Jose Perez. Fotografia with an S. I know, man. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and also, uh, orbital, orbital vision doctor. Um, I just did it really quickly. There's no, yeah, uh, no at, but Juan Jose Perez. Uh, it, hey, man, you got, you got these guys, Rob and Juan Jose, these are great photographers. You should follow them. I mean, real impressive in both cases. So, yeah, follow and say hello. Let's uh, cut things off. Anything to say real quick, Rob, before we just um, take off? Here's easy, robmoroto.com, yeah? Yep, that's, that's correct. And uh, I just got to say thank you for everyone who joined us today and submitted comments because uh, that's great. You gave us a lot to work with there. Uh, we are going to try and keep this as a regular thing. And if you have any kind of topics that you'd like us to talk about, uh, send them along. Uh, send them in the, uh, the Facebook group or send them to us uh, individually. Uh, we're, I think we're all on Instagram and Facebook. So DM us, friend us, like us, follow us, please like us. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can, send, you can send messages on the HDR soft page. You can send them to any, either of us. Um, uh, my own, just my own stuff is just my name as well. Um, and at our pepper on Instagram. Uh, yeah, but just send us, ideas for the next ones and questions ahead of time and we'll hit it i'm thinking next time might be drone versus pole maybe something yeah. like that interesting okay. <laughs> well guys yeah. and and also anybody that if you want to appear on here you can um you can pop on if you like and uh let's take it from there um thanks everybody for watching um you. Nice to talk to you guys. bye everybody that's commenting in there real quick and uh yeah have a good have a good weekend you friday too. we'll see you friday Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care.